Good morning. How's my family this morning? I hope you're all fired up. Boy, the music was really good. Let's give the band a hand again, man. Thank you, guys. It's going to take me a minute to get. Y'all see me doing some strange things. I got this new Garth Brooks mic looking thing sitting out here. And I'm not used to that. I had a little bitty one last week. It wasn't working right. So Ron goes, I'm going to get you a new one. So then it has this big fuzzy thing on it. I'm not good with change, y'all. I'm sorry. I try. You know, but we'll do the best we can. There you go. I'm not going to fly across the room or anything. So we're all good, right? <laughs> I hope you all had a great fourth. Uh, I saw so many people enjoying the parades and the festivities that were going on along with the fireworks and everything. We had a good group come out here. Uh, the fourth and saw some great fireworks and you know it was a great week and uh, for me my wife was uh, she was at church camp with a bunch of 1300 kids at this one church camp and uh, we had our group go and uh, she said she saw a lot of great praise and worship a lot of kids being saved great speakers great time and uh, you know when I spend a week alone I can tend to get into things you know from time to time she left me notes all over the mirror. I mean, I go in and I can't even see myself because there's notes and prayers all over it. And, and I didn't notice all of them. That's bad, right? She told me. But you know what? I got a lot done around the house. But you know, I said on the 4th of July, usually we're together. It's not likely she'd be gone on the 4th of July, but this time she was. So you may not believe this, but I took the opportunity to go fishing. In fact, I went to a little lake down here in East Texas called Lake Fairfield with my son-in-law, Josh, and his boss. So we just took off early that morning, and many of you are not familiar with the lake. The lake is, or was, a power plant lake, which means they suck all the cold water into the, to the power plant, and then it cools, it cools it down, and it comes back out the other end, but it comes out warm. And it keeps the lake warm year-round. In fact, in the summer, the lake gets up near, the water temperature itself gets up around 100, you know, when, when it's pumping, yeah. So, oh yeah, absolutely. And in the winter, you know, the water temperature, if you fall in, that's the best place to be because it's warmer in the water than the outside temperature. But it actually uh, helps the fish grow year-round. And uh, they, they've shut that off. They've shut down some of these power plants that are run by coal and... Uh, because it's not cost efficient anymore, they say. So they shut off the uh, power plant. So no longer is the water really, really hot. And uh, one thing that made the lake special when the power plant was running is they were able to put special species of fish in there that wouldn't survive any other way if the water wasn't warm. They had uh, saltwater fish that actually were able to convert to freshwater. One was the redfish, a red drum that some of you may be familiar with. The other one was uh, tilapia. They put these in the lake and they survived very good. Now, tilapia is a fish that eats, doesn't hit lures, it won't hit a live bait, and it eats grass or algae and stuff like that. So it kept the lake under control, you know, so it didn't get overtaken with any kind of growth of weeds and stuff like that. But now that they've shut the parkland off, of course, the hydrilla's growing. The fishing has actually gotten better for bass, and uh, it's a pretty cool lake. It's a neat place to visit, but when the power plant was running, there were several people in these small boats that would come out and cast net in the whole lake because tilapia is a really good eating fish for a lot of people. I don't eat that much fish. I like catching them, but I'm not a big fish eater, but they would do, throw all these cast nets out all the time and catch all of these tilapia. And there wasn't any limit on them. You catch as many as you want to. But you think about it, when you cast net, sometimes you would catch game fish. And it's against the law to catch, to get game fish in a net and put it in your, you know, keep it at all. And even throwing a cast net, you have to have a fishing license. So there are a lot of rules. But since the power plant's been cut off, the tilapia have died. And it started a growth of the grass throughout the lake. But there's still people coming out throwing those cast nets. And me as a fisherman, I have issues with it because I know the tilapia are no longer there and I don't think they're going to catch a bunch of minnows and bait fish and really take them and eat them. But on top of that, these groups that were coming out doing that 
they're going in areas that they're not allowed. There's buoys in the swim area, all along the swim area. So when we went that morning, we're fishing along this point outside the buoys, and there are people inside the swim area, inside the buoys, that say no boats. And they're in there violating the law. And there are people that are along the swim area on the bank, and there are people sitting on the dock and um, peer out where we are fishing, and they all see them. And they're watching them, and it bothers them. You can tell it bothers them. But you know, nobody would say anything at all to them, except Reg. You know, I watched for a few minutes, and I thought somebody else might speak up because they were closer to them, and I'm a long ways away. But I got a big, loud mouth, and it don't bother me at all, right? So I told them. I yelled at them and said, hey, you're not supposed to be in there. It says no boats right here. And if you don't get out, I'm calling the park ranger. I've never seen a little boat move so fast in my life to have a little bit of motor on it. They come shooting out of there. The point is, the point I'm trying to get at here is I pay my taxes, I buy my license, and I go by the rules. And so should everybody else. Amen? We should not show special exceptions to people just because they want to violate the law. And more and more this goes on in our society that we turn a blind eye to it. And we say, hey, we don't want to get involved. You know, the two guys with me, my son in law, and the people sitting on the dock and everywhere else, they thought I was some kind of crazy guy, I guarantee. But I'm serious. It's, it's, this stuff has gone on way too long. And when you start messing with fishing, you kind of got on my bad side, right? It's kind of like if somebody was messing with this church group right here, my family, we got a problem, right? I'm going to say something, amen? It's the way it should be. So I think sometimes that, you know, I guess where I'm going with this, the best way to say it is that when people are doing things that bother us, we should speak up. We're afraid to get involved. We're afraid of the consequences that are the repercussions that you get from people. We're also that way when it comes to dealing with the Lord. Sometimes, you know, we know things are wrong and people are doing things that are against what pleases the Lord. And us as Christians should hold them accountable and call them out on it. I don't even care if they're not a Christian. They still should, still should be pointed out right now. There's a difference between holding somebody accountable and judging somebody. But there's also a difference between right and wrong. And many of us know that. Amen. So we have to determine, are we right in what we're doing? If it's, especially if it's somebody violating the law or violating you know, some of the commands that's going to damage their marriage or their life or something like that. As Christians, we need to hold them accountable. What it made me wonder through this whole experience on the fourth there on the lake, just how much are we as Christians willing to tolerate how much are we willing to put up with till finally enough is enough? Same thing, I ask the Lord all the time, when have you had enough? Because we see things throughout our society that is, it's going in a really bad direction. And I assure you, when he's had enough, everybody's going to know. You know, there's not going to be anyone left out at all. And there's so many people today that believe they are entitled, entitled, and rules don't apply to them. I mean, that's the society change in our world today. They also believe that because they don't like the rules, they should be changed to fit them. I don't like the rules, so y'all need to change this so it will work for me. Many, believe it or not, many people really actually believe that. Seems our country has changed to the point where if someone doesn't like something, it needs to be changed are made politically correct so they can get their way. Many of you know me. I'm about as far away from politically correct as you can get because I don't believe they're correct. Amen? Amen. At the 1996 American Baseball Coaches Association Convention, John Scolius presented a speech that was as true and direct as anyone could have imagined. John was an American college football and baseball coach from 1946 until 1991. He was truly a phenomenal coach and a faithful Christian leader 
who led by example. In 1996, Coach Golius was 78 years old and five years retired from a college coaching career. So he'd been in it all his life. He had seen a lot. He walked to the stage wearing a string around his neck with a bright white baseball home plate hanging around it from the string. And after speaking for about 20 minutes and never ever mentioning the, the prop he had hanging around his neck through the whole thing, people began to wonder, did he forget about the prop? You know, he's 78 years old. Did he just forget about it hanging there? Well, no, he hadn't. Finally, he said... You're probably wondering why I'm wearing this home plate around my neck. The reason I stand before you today is to share what I've learned in my life and what I've learned about home plate in my 78 years. He had one question for everyone there. The question was, do you know how wide home plate is in every league from little league all the way to the pro level? He had several answers and many of them were, were correct. How many of you know? Any of you know how wide a, a home plate is? There we go. We got a few. 17 inches is the answer for every baseball league. Every home plate is 17 inches wide. His next question was, what do they do with a big league pitcher who can't throw the ball over a 17-inch plate? When he can't continually do that, what do they do with him? <laughs> they either send them back to the minors or they get rid of them. That's pretty well the way it is. He went on to say, what they don't say to him, it's okay that you can't hit a 17-inch target. We'll just make it 18 or 19 inches. How about we make it 20 inches or 25 inches so you have a better chance of hitting the strike zone? They didn't say that to him. Then he asked this question to the coaches at this convention. What do we do with our best player when our best player shows up late for practice? When our team rules forbid facial hair and a guy shows up unshaven? What if he gets caught drinking? Do we hold them accountable or do we change the rules to fit them? Basically, do we widen the plate for them? Good question, right to the point. This is the problem in our homes today. That's going on in our homes today. It's the way we respond to our spouses, our children, our family, and our friends makes a difference. Are we willing to tolerate some of the things that go in our own homes and around us? Or are we widening the plate and looking the other way? Making it easier for them to continue to be and do the things that they're doing. We widen the plate. We don't hold them accountable for their actions. But instead allow them to continue with no consequences for failing to meet the standards and to follow the rules. We widen the plate. We're all guilty of it. If you have children, you have grandchildren, you've probably been widening the plate a little bit. It's not healthy, it's not good for our society, and it's not good for our children coming up behind us. John shared that this is the problem with our schools today. The quality of our education is going downhill fast, and the teachers have been stripped of the tools they need to be successful and to educate and discipline our young people today. We're allowing others to widen the plate for us. Amen? Many of you probably have seen or read about uh, all the parents, coaches, and school administrators that cheated on college entry tests to allow someone's child easy access into certain colleges. Instead of allowing their child to succeed on their own, they widen the plate. You want to know what's wrong with society today? Right there. That's one of the biggest problems we have going on in society. The same problem is going on with our churches. Exactly the same problems are going on. Many pastors stay away from sermons and issues that might not be politically correct or tend to reserve accountability as not to upset anyone. It's going on right in our churches. They're afraid to speak. They want to make sure they're politically correct. 
You know, this big old boot gets in my mouth a whole lot. I know. But you know what? God leads me. And it, sometimes you just had enough. You say, hey, this is what God's telling me to say, and I'm going to say it as clear as I can. But I want you to understand, God laid this on my heart. This is not about me. This is not a political statement. It's what God laid on my heart. Do you know people, they, Christians in the church also, they even took, try, change, try to change or ignore God's word so it might not offend someone. Change or ignore God's word so it won't offend someone. Churches are widening the plate also. It's everywhere today. By trying to be politically correct and withholding accountability, we're allowing our families, our friends, and our faith to continue down down an undesirable path that we know that is not pleasing to God. We need to correct this. We need to pay more attention to this. Everybody gets a trophy now. Everybody's a winner now. When they get out in the world... These young people today, when they get out in the real world, they've got a hard lesson to learn. They're just going to want the plate widened. And there are going to be some out there that's not about that at all. To succeed in life. Our world will continue down a path of darkness if we fail to hold ourselves to a higher standard. A standard of what we know to be right. Remember that part, a standard that we know to be right, God's word. Amen? If we fail to hold our spouses, children, family, and friends to the same standard, we're failing them. It's time for us to remind our schools, our churches, and our government to hold themselves accountable to the ones they serve. With all the campaigning going on, and you see it, it's already kicked off. All the campaigning, everybody's getting ready. They want to run for president. We've got a field of Democrats that are just astronomical. The problem is, is they're promising people anything they want to hear. They're widening the plate for people just to get their vote. That's wrong. Amen? It's up to us to stop that as Christians. Amen? Don't vote for somebody that's just going to widen the plate for you. Or for somebody else. We hear it over and over again. And it's not just with the Democrats. It's with the Republicans. I'm not being one-sided or the other. I'm saying our political people that are stepping out there today. Are widening the plate for a lot of people to fail. That's what's happening to our world today. But as Christians. We're being chastised for that. Because we speak up. As a Christian. we're, We're the bad people. We're the deplorables. We're the people that are lower on the standard. That we don't know what we're talking about. We're worshiping some fake God in the sky. I wouldn't want to be the one saying that. Amen. Amen. Because of God and our faith, we're allowed to be here today to worship that God. We have... All kinds of wars we fought. We've had veterans that have given their lives so we would have that right and all. But without God behind it, it wouldn't be happening at all. Amen? So we need to make sure that we're confident enough to hold people accountable. We need to make sure we're confident enough that the Lord is with us, that if we're right, we're right. And if we can back it up with Scripture, amen, we're right. Amen? Amen? Don't be afraid to speak up and don't widen the plate. American political activist Thomas Paine quoted it this way. A body of men holding themselves accountable to nobody ought not be trusted by anybody. I agree. Every pastor, every leader, every person just attends church, every Christian should have an accountability person in their life that's not afraid to say, you're messing up here. This is not a path that you want to be on. Without accountability, we see pastors fall all the time. I have great elders and people around me, and they're not afraid to hold me accountable at all, and I love them for that. It keeps me out of trouble because it's easy to get there, and it would keep each and every one of us out of trouble if we had those accountability partners. 
You may not listen to them, but at least they're planting the seed. Amen? The life standard of this world may have changed, but God's life standards have not changed. God's word and commands remain the same today, tomorrow, and forever. He's not going to widen the plate. So with people thinking that way, they're in for a rude awakening. God did not widen the plate when King David, a man after God's own heart, sinned by murdering Uriah and taking his wife to be his own. God didn't widen the plate. Let's look at it. Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11. Once again, I pray you brought your Bibles with you. I prefer you take God's word, not mine. We're going to read it right here. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11. Now remember, we're picking up here where we know David has already sinned and he's being called out on it. This is what the Lord says out of your own household. I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do the thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord. The son born, the son born to you will die. Consequences for what he did. God didn't widen the plate and say, hey, this is a man after my own heart. I'm going to make it okay. It's okay this time. He didn't widen the plate. And he's not going to widen the plate. God didn't widen the plate for the Samaritan woman at the well. Let's look at that. John chapter 4, verse 7. John chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone on into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can I get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't be thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. He did not say, Hey, it's okay. He didn't turn and look the other way or turn a blind eye to it. He told her point blank, point blank right up front, you're correct. But basically you're living in sin. And she's trying to sugarcoat it, amen? He didn't didn't widen the plate for her. He knew she was wrong. So he wasn't going to change the standard. And I think that's where we fail sometimes is we are afraid to say when someone's wrong in that aspect. You know, in today's society, and this may hit home with a bunch of people today, but you know what? It's run through uh, family genes and everything else. On my side is two people living together, and they won't get married because the government's supporting them. That's wrong. That is dead wrong. And that's not political. That's wrong. God said marriage is between a man and a woman. And if you're living together and you're drawing money from the government because you don't want to get married, then you are wrong. And if you come to me that way, I will hold you accountable. Whether you like it or not, I'm sorry. I'm just being open, and it's true. You don't back up because that's not what God's word says. Amen? 
Now, that doesn't make you a bad person, but it gives you something to think about. Amen? Because we're supposed to love everyone. And that doesn't make me love you any less. But don't ask for my opinion, because you will get it. From the beginning, from the very beginning of man, God has not widened the plate one time. From the very beginning. He did not widen the plate when Adam and Eve sinned by eating the forbidden fruit. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. We know that uh, Eve has already eaten, ate the forbidden fruit and gave it to Adam. And we're going to pick up on verse 16 where the Lord has already uh, come back into the garden and is talking to him. On chapter uh, verse 16, to the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I command you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since you were taken from the dust, you are, and to dust you will return. He didn't widen the plate for them, right? The reason all this sin's in our world right there because he could say, hey, it's okay, right? But he didn't widen the plate for any of these people, and he's not going to widen the plate for us. His word is true, and we should believe in God's word. I've heard it put to me this way even recently, that someone knows God, but they don't believe God's word. They don't believe the Bible because it was written by man. If you don't believe God's word, you don't believe in God. Amen? That's true. Point blank. Because God's word is the inspired word of God. And we should believe in it. And right here, God brought forth accountability and consequences to both Adam and Eve. We know that God... Is not going to widen the plate to allow us to meet the world's standards. He is going to hold us accountable to his standards. Really, really clear. Let's look at Romans chapter 1 verse 18. I know we're flipping through here pretty fast. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. So the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the, uh, God, uh, the, all the godliness, lessness, and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. When it comes to the standards of God that he set forth to this, we have no excuse for trying to widen the plate or changing God's standards at all. We have no excuse for that. I know this subject's a little touchy, but it is what it is. I know in today's society today, people have lots of excuses of why they do what they do and why they don't do what they do and all that. I hear it all the time. And I know some of these things that go on are true. But when a person acts irrationally and doesn't want to be held accountable because they're bipolar, I have a problem with that. There is a bipolar polar problem. I'll assure you that. And some people really have it. But there's many more using that excuse to get away with what they're doing in today's society and don't want to be held accountable for it. It's a problem. My kid has HDHD or whatever, hyperactive, all that. I believe that. There's lots of kids that are, are hyper. 
But we created that problem. We really did. Because we widened the plate for them. We don't hold our own children accountable. We don't hold our own family accountable. We don't hold our friends accountable. If you're a professing Christian here today, it is called upon you to hold those people accountable when they're wrong. Once again, it's not up to you to judge them. That's God's job. Amen? But it is to up to each and every one of us to hold them accountable for their actions. And they can use every excuse they want. But you know, there's times when those excuses aren't going to bail them out in the future. It's not going to bail any of us out. And we're all going to stand before God and give account for our lives. The Bible says every knee will bow. Not one of us are going to get away with not standing before God. I like it where it says in the Lord's Prayer. In, on the earth as it is in heaven. Why can't it be that way? Because sin's in this world. Are we going to be perfect? No. The Bible says strive to be like Jesus. Wouldn't it be great if we could all do that? Wouldn't this world be so great if we could do that? You know, that's never going to happen. Sure it is. Because Jesus is going to make sure it happens one way or another. Amen. I always say, I can't change the whole world, but I can change my little part of it, right? It starts with us, each one of us today. There's a stern, very, very stern warning in the Bible that tells us not to change God's word or his commands. I'd like for you to look at that with me. We're in Revelations, which we hardly ever go. Chapter 22, verse 18 Revelations chapter 22, beginning at verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of the people who express. Oh, I'm in the wrong place, ain't I? Nope. I'm reading you what I already read you. Y'all are looking at me like, what is wrong with him? Sorry, I got into it. <laughs> I warn everyone who hears these words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them... God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll or prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. We should all commit no matter what to keep our spouses children, family, and friends, and especially ourselves at 17 inches. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today. We lift this day to you, Father. We thank you for your presence that's felt throughout this building. Father, I know sometimes you ask us to bring forth a message that's uncomfortable for people. But Father, I thank you for that. Because when we get comfortable... We forget about you. So, Father, I pray today that each and every one of us take hold of this message.